So if there's a man listening and you're like, why do I get triggered by my spouse with the dishes? Or why do we get in a fight around the dishes? If I were to unpack that, I'd say, hey, you're getting nervous system triggered. Something's triggering either you or your spouse's nervous system. And that's triggering. And from all the past pressure from the grief that's built up, that's throwing you into dysregulation. And then you avoid being with that, which is really you avoid being with yourself to go somewhere else to cope with that. And then usually those coping mechanisms are actually what's stopping you from the business, the purpose, the relationship, all the things you actually want. So it's really the relationship with yourself and your heart. If I had to num boil it down and, and grief work is work of the heart. Welcome to Men This Way. Joshua Winner, my brother. What's up, man? Welcome to Men This Way. Hey, happy to be here, Brian and Tate. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, glad to have you. Tate, of course, as always, welcome to your show, Men This Way. Josh, I've been super excited about this conversation, um, you know, talking about grief. And one of the things that I've just been so present to over the last several years is how much grief is in the air. But I, I, I'm not sure that I even knew that it was grief that I was dealing with or that the guys that are, were around me dealing with. And it's a topic that isn't, doesn't seem like it's fun to talk about, but it's obviously an important one, but, but Brian, I know you had, you wanted to jump right in with, with asking maybe to talk about that. Well, you know, as I thought, we thought about this episode and we, we, you know, Josh, you, you've had a, a profound journey, grief journey. And, and we're going to dive into that, but as we're contemplating the questions, like how, where do we want to begin? The first thing that arises for me is if I'm a guy, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this at all. Why would I want to talk about this? Even if I am grieving something obvious, my first instinct is get over it, man. This just gets in the way of, you know, I don't know, peace of mind. What just, I don't want to talk about this. So I think I'd, what I'd like to do is just address that right up front. Why does this conversation matter? Great question, Brian. Um, what, I, what I would say is most people look at grief as like, have I had somebody die recently um, in the last couple of years? Somebody may have never had a grief. They're, they're not looking at the broader sense of grief. And, and the window that I look at is we all have grief and it boils back down to childhood. If we just start at childhood, and I think I'll do two things. I think I'll unpack this in a way where it'll start to land and it'll start to land why we all have grief where somebody listening is going to go, oh, I can see how this is affecting me. So first, I want to start off with this piece of uh, um, imagine we're in the womb and you're sitting there in the womb. Everything's taken care of, right? Your meals are taken care of. You're just floating around in a nice little warm sack. Life is good. You fall in love with this world where your reality is you just get to chill, you relax. And then what happens one day? What happens, you get ripped out of one world and birthed into another world. So the world you fell in love with, with what you fell deeply in love with was taken from you and you get born into this new world. And how do we move through that cycle of change? Do we come in happy and giddy and laughing? Or do we come in grieving? S screaming. Screaming. And yeah, so, so I'm going to use the frame, we come into this world grieving. So shouldn't that be the fundamental tool that we learn to move through change? And if we really start to understand this, any, any area a man's going through right now, whether it be his current relationship with his health, whether it be his actual intimate relationship, whether it be his finances, his purpose, any hero's journey that he's on, the reason he's not getting faster or growing further is most likely is there's a death and rebirth happening. There's a death of one world, who we used to be, who the relationship used to be, who the body used to be, some sort of death is happening and he's resisting feeling the grief of that death, which means he's prolonging moving to the next phase of growth to actually get present again and get happy again. So any man listening, if he can fundamentally learn how to do grief work well, um, Robert Bly says, a man should learn to drink grief like a fish drinks water when moving through the abyss. And it's one of the phases in the hero's journey, but really if you wanna do life well, if you get really good at grief, you get really good at moving through change well. So I'm just gonna broaden that from what we internalize grief as this messy thing where somebody died and now I'm stuck grieving, which looks weak, to 
It's the fundamental tool set to move through a death and rebirth, which is change. And we're all moving through change in every area of our life on a regular basis. So you get really good at this, you move fast. And men want to move quickly. They don't want to be stuck in shit. That's why they resist grief. But if you resist grief, you just prolong staying stuck for days, weeks, months, years, decades. So the better you can get at this tool set, and it's just a tool set. I want to reframe it from a, it doesn't mean you're weak as a human. It doesn't mean that you're, there's something wrong with you or there's something broken with you, which we'll address a little later. It just means, ah, I fell in love with one world. I fell in love with my body and then I aged. I fell in love with my relationship and now my wife's going through a change or I went through a change. I fell in love with this investment I made and now the market changed or something shifted. There's something we fell in love with and that thing's taken from us. And when it's taken from us, we experience heartbreak. And when we experience deep heartbreak, grief is the natural expression of that heartbreak. Well, I think also of, of you know, this epiphany I had some time ago that even going from single man to partnered man, even as much as I wanted to be in a relationship, there was grief in losing being single, uh, losing you know, certain freedoms, liberties, uh, uh, spaciousness, right? Relationship takes up a lot of space. And, and so what I'm hearing you say is that one of the, the, the great impacts of us not recognizing grief and not talking about it, not leaning into it, not embracing this part of the change of the tr of, of transition, whether a negative, you know, something unwanted or even something wanted, um, is that I actually don't fully enter into the the new state, whether it's somebody li literally being dead and that's the new reality, or being in a relationship that I said I wanted and now I have it, but I can't fully be present for it because I'm still, there's, there's a grief. You know, we've seen men also in new relationships have to grieve past relationships that they, they didn't even know that there was still grief yet there to, to move through. And that came up all of a sudden. So um, it, it's really fascinating. Tate, what do you think? Yeah, I, well, one of the things I, I really love about the way that you, you've started this conversation is, is uh, broadening the scope, right? Because you're right that I think that in large measure, men find grief through death. That's, there's something that dies. And usually uh, my experience is it is a person, either a, a relationship or a actual person who has died. And in, in many ways, I, I guess what I think about is therefore we don't go looking for grief. Grief in many ways ends up finding us, right? The first time I remember being faced with, with grief was my grandmother died, right? That was the first time that grief How old hit were you? me. Uh, I was middle school, seventh, sixth or seventh grade. And it was right after, uh, it was right after, um, uh, NASA's shuttle launched and, and exploded. Challenger. Yeah. The Challenger exploded. And so that was like a, a grief moment that society was feeling. It's one of those 9 11 moments where you remember where you were when it happened. Uh, but I guess those two events were these moments where one was grief in the world and the other was a personal grief, but it was a death. And then the way that you're framing it is, is it's much broader than that. And my guess is for you, Joshua, that, well, my, my question for you is, when did grief find you? When was that moment that grief found you? And how did, how did that kind of set a tone for you to go into this work? Yeah, I'll, I'll say two things. One, I'll talk about my conscious awareness of grief. And, um, and then two, with a lot of the deeper work I've done, I've realized there's a lot of childhood griefs, um, grief that I had that I never knew was actual grief until I've done deeper work and learn to heal those parts of my, my heart. But what I will say is, um, I had a lot of deaths in childhood. So I had, um, something like 20 something deaths between high school and college. So I was just around death quite a bit in my youth. And I was the guy that would show up and handle things. So I didn't look at it necessarily in a negative manner. I just was like, oh, I'm the guy that can show up and be calm and direct everybody and get everybody in a good place to make meaning or make sense of what's happening. And um, for me, I'd say the, the bigger, larger story was when my brother came to see me during Christmas in 2007 and said, hey, man, I've been shooting needles. I got a heroin addiction. If I don't move in with you and come live with you, if I go back to Reno, I'm going to die. 
And um, I just had a startup company. I'd funded it on credit cards. I had computers all over the living room. I was an enabler, so I didn't know how to take care of him. So I told him no. And two days later, he went back and died of a heroin overdose. And so that really led me into the, the grief journey of, I guess, the forced grief journey of trying to fix something I couldn't fix. The rest of them, I felt like I could fix it. As a man, we want to fix shit. So I was like, oh, I can fix that. I can compartmentalize it. This I couldn't. And it led me down a much deeper journey um, to, to uncover the work that I do now around grief, grief and loss. Yeah, to, to go, if I were to go a little bit deeper in how I got here, would that be helpful to kind of connect the dots on that yeah, piece? Yeah, please, definitely, definitely. So I did what most, I'd say men or a lot of guys do is I just put it in a box, found out my brother died. I cried that day, then I put it in a box, flew home, took care of the service, actually led the service, came back and just went to work building my company at the time. Um, and I could compartmentalize it until 2008. This was 2007 at Christmas, my brother died. 2008 hits, well, the market in 2008 crashes. So I come home one day to finding my business partner runs off with my girlfriend because the economy is crashing and we're fighting. And so in one moment I lost my business, my business partner, my girlfriend, and I had to claim bankruptcy because I made the mistake of funding the credit card, uh, funding the credit cards to fund the company, never paid myself back. And so I was in like the throes of grief, not only with my brother, but in all the areas of my life, I almost felt like I was naked getting kicked. And I did what a lot of achievers do. I find people do two things. Um, they get stuck in the wound or they avoid the wound at all costs. I was that guy that had, would avoid the wound at all costs and used achievement or savior mindset to deal with my grief. And so I, I thought if I just get back, how quick could I get back up and not deal with it meant I was resilient. So at the time I went and became a speaker with Tony Robbins and helped everybody else transform their life. I got really good at changing meanings. Like what does this meaning make? And I got really good at using NLP to change my body and changing stories that I had, thinking that I'd healed myself, but really what I'd done because I blocked myself from feeling the grief, I just kind of looked for any areas I was feeling it and shut it off. So in a sense, I thought I was whole, but I became this empty shell. And I didn't know it at the time. And um, I find our purpose is always here. We just have to listen. And people kept showing up around the grief and loss space. And I would be helping people around death and grief and I was like, I have to take a serious look at this. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go fully into grief. And I got on grief forums and was like, I'm going to start helping people with this amazing tool set I have. I'm going to help you fix your grief. And I failed miserably. And um, just like, well, I'm laughing because I remember you, 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 you got a movie coming out soon uh, about this, about your grief journey. And I remember I watched the screening of it just, what, a couple months ago? And I remember that, I love that part of your story about how like, yeah, man, superhero, here I come, savior. <laughs> we talk a lot about the, the, uh, the victim, savior, uh, persecutor triangle in our, in our relationship work, Tate and I do with, with guys. And, and so I just remember that part of like, yup, I got this, Tony Robbins crushing it. And then fucking flat on my face, misery, like that did not work. So I'm just laughing because that's, that's what we do though. Right. So anyway, keep going, man. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And so, um, it, because of the nature of it and the people that I was even supporting on these forums, it's, you can't just fumble your way through it, right? It's a very serious thing that people are dealing with. I won't get into the context of their stories, but it was very real, serious things that people were dealing with that I had to take ownership and realize I don't have the tools. And so I started researching grief. And when I started researching it, I realized there's actually still to this day, there's very, there's two main narratives around, around grief. And a lot of the top experts don't agree on uh, maybe the scientific term of what grief is and how it happens, but in general, can it be healed? Is it, do you heal from grief? There's a lot of differing opinions, especially a decade ago when I started this work. And there, there's two main schools of thought. One is like grief is a condition that's now in the DSM-5 um, and you need to be medicated. And there's even like a complicated grief. I think it's, it's called, uh, there's another name for it. It was complicated grief then. They change it to something else now. Um, or it's a natural human response and something that we all go through. So there's kind of two schools of thought on how people look at it. Um, and I chose to grab a camera and start interviewing people. For, for some reason in my journey, all the people that were the more science-based approach, I either couldn't get a hold of or they denied interviews with me. Some of them had had death threats. And so I have compassion for why they wouldn't want to be talking about it. But I got a lot of heart-based people who had been at helping families in 9-11, Boston bombing, Sandy Hook shootings, and had spent their whole career helping families deal with grief. And that, that was really who I interviewed. And I remember one of my first set of interviews, I interviewed a guy named Ken Druck. 
And here's a man who lost his daughter tragically. His whole family fell apart because of it. Because one, one thing I'll say is when grief happens, the way families deal with it, this is my theory is depending on how they deal with it. Um, some like to just wash it away and move forward. Others need to sit in it. And those two varying extremes, 50% of families fall apart is the stats on grief. And so his family had fallen apart when he lost his daughter with his wife and his other, his other daughter. But he, he was so clear because he'd been doing the work. Like I could not look, listen to what he said. He had so much compassion when he said it. And he introduced this concept of we are broken and whole. And I'd subscribe to the whole personal development narrative of like, we're whole, we're whole, we're not broken, we're whole. And I'd been wanting to fix any part of me that felt broken to be whole again or resist any part of me that felt broken or weak. And when he introduced this concept, it was more of a concept is we live in a dualistic world. And so when you go through deep love, when you fall in love with something deeply and it's taken from you, you feel deep heartbreak. And that heartbreak is the feeling of brokenness. And sometimes those parts of your heart can't be fixed. And, in, and it's actually in learning to love and accept those parts of you is how you become whole again, because you're, you're accepting the broken and the whole. And in that acceptance, which is a lot of the work I teach around grief. Now I teach these four levels of dealing with emotional trauma and the level four is acceptance and change. And you have to move into a place of acceptance that my heart may always feel broken. And how do I get really loving and gentle and sweet with myself when that heart breaks there? And with it, it, it kind of forced me to look at all the past heartbreaks, my brother, like everything that I thought I'd fixed and gotten over, I was like, it's still here. And, and it was such a different um, take on looking at grief. And so forced me to go into the grief. I did it on my own back then, didn't have any guides or support or tools. And in sitting there and facing a lot of my grief, but at the time came with a lot of numbing because I didn't know what I was doing. And, but it took me about two years of just facing and sitting and moving through these different grief practices um, all of a sudden one day I woke up and I was like, I actually feel more at peace with myself now that I've gone into the grief and learned to love and accept it than I did with the, all the external forms of grasping that I was doing. Like I want a better body or I want this partner or I want this money or I was looking for these things and then I would get it and then it would be fleeting and I'd choose another thing and finally going inward and actually learning to love all the parts of myself that were quote unquote broken and just be there with myself um, has actually started to bring me back to life again. And so I got really inspired and created a set of frameworks with a coach and started doing men's retreats, taking men in the mountains to start to get them really safe to go into all the parts of themselves that they've been resisting to actually feel the grief and the sadness that was there and to learn to love it. And um, that led into doing work with fire and police and military because I had them come through my retreats. And that's kind of where I'm at now is I've, I've been doing that for a decade and doing a lot of retreats with men, um, helping them heal the different parts of themselves by learning to love them, really soften into the parts that are feeling heartbroken and learning to feel and accept and offload. A lot of that I've used a lot more somatics now and ways to get into the body um, versus just talk is how it started. And now it's a lot more somatic based, but yeah, that led me to first responders. And I now train a lot of fire, police, military and how to help them come home from the trauma because suicide is now the number one cause of death for fire and police over line of duty deaths. So you're more likely to die from a suicide than getting, you know, killed from running into a fire or a shootout on the street. And then now I help high achievers. That's really what I've gone into is, and it's, this is why I think everybody listening will relate. I help high achievers that have oftentimes achieved high levels of financial freedom, but they're struggling with their relationship or they're struggling with, why do I still wear a mask when I try to engage with certain groups of men? Like there's something missing from their life. And when we go to the work, it's, it's grief. There's, there's areas or pockets from childhood way long ago that they totally forgot about where they felt abandoned and they didn't get their needs met. Um, some of their deepest core wounds where they felt inadequate, meaning not loved, not good enough, too much. Somebody wasn't there. Um, and so those two wounds I find are the kind of the first plates of grief besides coming out of the wound. And then we have layers and layers and layers of, of heartbreak and as we described earlier, that are all stacked. And so there's all this like pressure in our center column this is where the grief is at. And it's just layers and layers of it. And it, I kind of see it now as a pressure of like, there's- Hey, hey Josh, can I, can I, can sure. I just kind of pause you for just a second? Because this, you, you're, you're taking us on an incredible journey, man. And there's, there's so much, you, you have so much background and experience. I mean, you've said some things like 20 deaths that you- and when, and when you say, because I know you, you know, you and I go, we've got a deep friendship that goes years back now, 
and I'm just so grateful for it. I mean, you've shared with me, like you, you actually had to clean up from people's deaths in high school at like that time, you know, people that you knew. I mean, you were not just people who died, but whose deaths in some way you had to participate in, you know, the, the cleanup, to put it just crudely. Um, also, you said something that that really stuck with me that I want to check in with you about. I want to hear more from you about. Uh, oh, by the way, side note, I got to assist at one of your retreats, your resiliency retreats, right? For the first responders. And man, you know, as a military vet myself, oh, dude, it's just such magic work, man, to, to help these guys knowing what they're going through and the, and the, and the bodies they're, they're, they're in many ways kind of stuck rigidly in and, and what they're carrying. So just, you know, just love that, love that work that you do. But you said we generally either avoid the wound or we get stuck in it, right? I'm an avoider. Tate, what are you, would you say? Uh, usually it depends. Um, if, if, I avoid at all costs until the heartbreak is too much for me. So you're an avoider. So we're all I'm avoiders avoid here. It, it, obviously, until we can't, right? That's the that's the nature of the voider. Until I can't avoid it anymore. Then, uh, but I'm I'm really curious to explore this. Like stuck in it, what does that look like? Because I know Tate, you and I, we've worked with men that that seem like they're they kind of get stuck in the wound, in the in the loss, and the trauma. And but I'm curious, Josh, what is that? tend to look like? So, so from my lens, they're all just survival strategies in childhood. So that's when I see them born is, is we go through that primary wound of abandonment, or let's call it inadequacy to keep it simple. And then how do we survive that? And, and let's say the achiever or those that become more of a savior dynamic are ones that are avoiding it. They're like, I don't want to deal with this. So I'm going to take care of everybody else, or I'm just going to achieve so much. I can stay so busy achieving, I don't have to deal with it. And then the ones that get stuck in it, I would say more instead of the savior, they play the victim role where they learn if I focus on my wound, people give me attention, I get connection, I get love from it. And so they get attached to the identity that of the wound, just like somebody gets attached to the identity of I'm the savior, I'm going to save everybody. They're both forms of avoiding dealing with the grief in essence. It's just, I find it kind of shadows into different segments of how we survive that wound. And it's oftentimes in our, in our family dynamics. So if there was somebody that's an achiever and let's say a younger sibling or another sibling couldn't be the achiever, maybe they tried to be the jokester or they tried to do something else. And if that didn't work, then they noticed they cried, they got attention. So it's just kind of how we were raised in our family units is how I see it initially born. Um, and then that just keeps going and transcending into our identity of how we see the world and how we navigate the world. So that's kind of the two big poles that I at least experience it in. And I find we need the opposites medicine. So those that get stuck kind of avoiding everything else, they actually need to go in and learn tools to feel and move through that grief and be with the wound. Those that are stuck in it actually need to go out and start serving other people, achieving, doing things outside of the wound instead of letting the wound drive their actual narrative. So we need each other's medicine. It makes total sense. I'm curious to just in a very practical sense, what are some of the kinds of losses that men, especially men, tend to overlook? Like, think, like, look, I get someone dies. Okay, there's, there's, that's a big event. Uh, marriage fails, big event. But what are some of the things that men go through, even in our younger lives, that that we may not realize are very likely impacting us in in a, in a grief sense? Yeah. So I'd say. You know, a, like, what did we fall in love with? I find the fantasies are the trickier ones. We fell in love with the fantasy that my parents would be together, and then there's a divorce. I fell in love with um, my friends are going to love me, and then I get abused, shamed, humiliated by my closest friends. Um, I fall in love with um, that people are kind, and then I get abused, betrayed, violated. Something happens to break that vision of falling in love. So it's, it happens with what did we fall in love with? And then what is taken back to that same narrative of de this death and rebirth, but it's what we fell in love with. And then oftentimes that's taken from us. And so if we keep broadening that, I fell in love with, I was, I mean, one of my own personal stories, I was going to be a millionaire by 28 and I worked relentless nights, weekends, and then I had heartbreak. And so then years pass, I find a lot of men get stuck here. They had a vision they fell in love with. I was going to be married with kids. I was going to be a millionaire. I was going to have a partner. 
I was going to have, I was going to travel the world and be a vagabond, like some vision they fell in love with that they romanticized and that they passed the age where they thought X would happen. And now unconsciously they're in this spiral of like feeling like they're not there enough or they can't, they missed it and they got to make up for it. And they're stuck because they haven't allowed themselves to grieve. It didn't happen and actually face the fact. So I find there's all kinds of mini micro things we fall in love with. And those are the ones that are trickier. The more grounded ones are, I invested in this business and it didn't work out. I had a partnership and got my heart deeply broken. You know, my, um, I got kicked out of my friend circle or I did something to hurt somebody in a friend circle and lost a close friend of mine. So there's more like physical grounded things that happen um, or loss of a loved one, loss of a pet, um, um, you know, some of those, those big ones. And then there's the emotional ones that are the vision, which I find are the trickier ones where if you, if you really land to that, that's, that those are the deep ones. Well, I think about just like father's day just passed. And I've, I've been sharing about my journey with my father and, 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 uh, David Kessler, who's another, you know, brilliant, brilliant grief, uh, journey, man said something that, that will stay with me. He said, uh, many of us had to grieve two fathers, the one we actually had and the ideal father we never had. Like that speaks to the fantasy part. There was this fantasy of a father that, that, yeah, it's like I carry a blueprint of that in my being and I never got that and, or I got fleeting glimpses of it uh, over the years. And, and boy, what a heartbreak lives inside of that, that I personally denied uh, just out of ignorance. It's not that I, it's like, no, 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 I'm not. I just literally was clueless. <laughs> that was something in my sphere. Tate, Tate, I'm curious what's coming up for you. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, one of the things that is just so powerful about this conversation is the, the, the different mechanisms or the different ways in which we get stuck, uh, inside of grief. And, you know, Francis Weller has this, uh, who's wrote, um, the wild edge of sorrow, also a grief journeyman has this beautiful quote, which is grief unmetabolized becomes bitter. And, you know, one of the things that's coming up for me is just realizing that for most of us men, if, if what you're saying is really bears true, which is that we can get stuck inside the wound of the grief or we, we avoid it, then the inevitable outcome is that it becomes unmetabolized. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on is he frames it that way. How would you frame unmetabolized grief? Um, and, and how does unresolved grief really impact the relationship that a man ends up having even with himself? Yeah, that's great questions. And, and I will first say that's the core relationship when, cause I do a lot of relationship work now, but I don't have this perfect relationship or even the amazing relationship like you do, Brian, and are teaching from experience of application. A lot of my work comes from actually working with grief and trauma in the nervous system. And that's really relationship with self. And so if I can be in relationship with myself, where I'm clear with my words and actions, I've moved through a lot of the pressure that's here. I'm not hijacked by my nervous system on a regular basis or past trauma. And then I can learn to really know myself. That's where I get good at needs and boundaries. That's where I can communicate really clearly. That's where I can see something for what it is versus actually choosing unhealthy partners or all that is, is really the unmet, unmetabolized grief. Or I look at it very visual. So another way that I would say that comment would be, I look at it as a pressure cooker. So like if you, if you have a pressure cooker, I see it as pressure in the center column because the grief is stuck in the center column. And let's say I have the grief from childhood and then I had a, a couple of breakups and then I lost money here and then I fell in love with somebody. Each one of those griefs builds up. And then what happens is when we have a new grief event, it triggers all the past grief we haven't dealt with that's stuck in the center column. Because the body just, if we, if we ground the body, it, it knows how to heal itself. So when you learn tools to go in and actually move the center column, that's what most things that grief related are, you're actually just moving the center column or the diaphragm. And when you move the diaphragm, the body releases stuck energy. So that metabolized grief is just stuck energy that we shove down instead of allowing it to move. And when we shove it down and we shove it down and we shove it down, it becomes a pressure cooker. And that's why I find most people, majority of people aren't willing to be with themselves. So what happens is that pressure cooker builds up. It throws our nervous system into the back of the brain, which is survival based because this is triggering my grief or my trauma from my past. And I want to make you the culprit of it. So I want you to change or you're the victim or you're the violator or 
I'm going to go to numbing behavior. So I'm going to go to alcohol, drugs, substance, porn, sex, some sort of an outlet because the greater the pressure, pressure, the greater the pain, past grief, past pain, the greater the pleasure that we try to seek to avoid dealing with these pieces. So for me, um, unmetabolized grief, I, from the lens I look through, is all the shit that doesn't work in your life. All boils down to unprocessed grief, which means you can't be with yourself. And if you can't be with yourself, because there's so much pressure here, you're gonna um, you're gonna adapt. So the adaption strategies, they're like our childhood adaptions, are ways to adapt to not feeling and integrating those parts of ourself, which really grief is work of the heart. And so what you're really doing is when you feel grief, you're learning to get in and offload all the layers of pain and heartbreak and, and grief that you have. And what it does, it brings you back to your heart. And when you're back in touch with your heart, you're back in touch with you. And when you're back in touch with you, you can operate very differently in the world. You don't need the devices. You don't need the numbing behaviors. You don't need unhealthy partners to recreate childhood again and again. Like we, all that kind of brushes away and we're able to just be clear and clean with who we are now. And we're able to be present when something happens. So if there's a man listening and you're like, why do I get triggered by my spouse with the dishes? Or why do we get in a fight around the dishes? If I were to unpack that, I'd say, hey, you're getting nervous system triggered. Something's triggering either you or your spouse's nervous system. And that's triggering. And from all the past pressure from the grief that's built up, that's throwing you into dysregulation. And then you avoid being with that, which is really you avoid being with yourself to go somewhere else to cope with that. And then usually those coping mechanisms are actually what's stopping you from the business, the purpose, the relationship, all the things you actually want. So it's really the relationship with yourself and your heart, if I had to num boil it down. And, and grief work is work of the heart. Well, what, what I'm hearing in that too, Josh, is very clearly that you, you said something like when we, when we get good at, at, at moving through grief, because it is a skill. I like that. Get good at it. It's a skill. It's something we can learn that we're able to then be more present, right? Be more of our just authentic self in the moment. And, and what I see inside of that also is it's like I become more willing to lose. I become more willing for loss. And you aren't going to have a good relationship if you aren't willing to lose it. And not, you're not going to succeed a business if you aren't willing to lose money, if you aren't willing for the business to fail. You know, Tate and I said something when we started our work together, we're like, look, man, our friendship is primary. And if at any point the business starts to get in the way of our friendship, we can that business, right? Our friendship is primary. And I think that, that it also speaks to a willingness to lose something that would be important to us, but, but in service of a greater cause, in this case, our friendship. And I think that's true in relationship. Like I'm willing to lose this argument for the sake of a good relationship with my spouse. I'm willing to lose, you know, a lot of men fall in the sword of freedom. You know, I'm, you can't tell me what to fucking do. You don't boss me around. To, and, I, and I'm all for that. You know, I'm not for relationships with, in which one partner's bossing the other around. But so many of us see a loss of freedom where it actually isn't happening, but we're so afraid of losing it that we'll die on the sword of freedom rather than like be willing to experience some grief around, okay, so I can't do this thing that I used to do when I was single. I can't just say whatever the fuck I want to, to this person in front of me, because my wife is, you know, sensitive or she doesn't like it. When I was single, I could just say whatever, you know? I mean, for me as a writer, I kind of went through that. Like I could just write whatever. And then I got into a relationship. It's like, nope, can't do that anymore because it impacts her. Even if it has nothing to do with her, it still impacts her. I had to grieve the loss of that part of my expression. And some people, again, you know, I think from the standpoint of, nah, man, freedom at all costs. You know, I can even judge myself for giving that up. But you know what? I have a fucking amazing relationship. And a big reason is because I spent a couple of years in the grief of letting this, that little, you know, adolescent hero in me that just wants to do whatever he needs to do, you know, letting that part go. And it did require some grief right but it's so i i just see so many layers to this man it's so rich and the the thing that's coming up for me is is i love the way you started this conversation because if 
it, with the question that you asked, Brian, because grief is largely not something that, that men want to feel, that people want to feel, right? There's something that's, that's very challenging about that. It does throw us in, as you've so eloquently stated, into the wound or into avoidance. Um, but, but something that Brian, you just said, and, and obviously Joshua, you're, you're articulating here is that it's, it may be a feeling, but it, it, most importantly, it is a skill that we need to develop. And one of the things that you're pointing to is the nervous system regulation as, as one of the primary skills that we have to learn as men in the world to be able to navigate what is surely going to come, which is death in a thousand different ways. And you know, maybe you could speak a little bit more uh, in addition to the nervous system regulation. What, what, what are the other facets or skills of grief that, that, that we need to be looking out for as men, both in the, the skills that we need to develop, but also in, as we're interacting and engaging with other men in the world, knowing that there may be some skills that they need to develop inside of that in, a, in addition to the nervous system regulation, which I want to come back to, but maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I would say your ability to be with your own grief is what allows you to be there with another man's grief. So, so you can't be there with somebody else when they're grieving. You're going to want to fix it. And so, and, and what are you going to, like, you're going through grief. If you've been through grief and somebody comes in and tries to fix it, what do you say? Fuck you, right? Like, like, cause, cause what it is, is we don't, that's how most of society, when they talk about the do's and don'ts during grief, to simplify it, the don'ts are don't try to fix somebody's grief, just be there with them. They don't need to fix it. And so if we can't be there with our own grief, we can't be there with anybody else's grief. And so what I find is if you want to hold space for your partner, if you want to hold space for another man to be with his experience, get good at your own grief work because you will not be able to be there with somebody else in a moment of weakness, in a moment of pain, in a moment of struggle and a moment of failure without you doing your own grief work, you're going to want to fix it, which is what we do really well as men, but you're lacking range. You're, you're, it's like, you got a, you got one gear on the truck and you don't have any flexibility. You don't have any range and it's survival of the most adaptable that survive, not survive, not, um, you know, survival of the fittest. That's actually a, a false. So if you want to adapt as a human and have more range and more flexibility, grief work is just a fundamental tool. So the, the way that I kind of see it unpacked is first, you have to be able to regulate your nervous system just to become present. Otherwise you're hijacked. And, and one more comment I will make is I would say, venture to say you're dealing with grief every day. You don't know it, but as a man listening, every time you get in a conflict with your spouse, you are in grief. Anytime that you are struggling with an area of your life that you feel a little bit down or a little, I'm going to say, like, if we just go to sensations, constricted, down, numb, anxious, um, depressed, any of those states, anytime you reach for something to, to, to cover something up, you're dealing with it every day. So it's not like if you really start to see the world through that, everybody's dealing with it on a regular basis. So when you learn how to go in versus out, um, that's what you could start to get into the, the work around this. And so first step is well, well, jo well Josh, yeah. just to, just to, just to double down on that because I mean, look, life is ultimately disappointing. Uh, the, the fantasies, the dreams, the the big visions that we have. I mean, pretty much every single one of us, even if we've achieved one of those, it's so you said it earlier. It's so fleeting that it it there's a letdown. That if if we if we don't sit with that, be with that, that grief, that moment of grief, if we don't know how to just be with that and let that be a part of the experience, oh, we're right off to the next distraction, the next pursuit. So I just want to double down on that because of what you're saying, I think is vitally important. Well, and and I think the cost of that is you don't get your purpose. Like, cause there's different types of men that are listening and they're like, why do I have to do this work? I can just put it in a box and go. Well, what if you don't get your purpose because you weren't willing to learn another tool set? How badly do you want your purpose? Because those that are a little bit more emotional are like, ah, you got me. I'm willing to do this work. It's what I would call the warrior archetype. We're going to be the ones that struggle the most to hear this. Like, mm, doesn't make sense. Well, if this is stopping you from getting what you want, would you learn a new tool set to actually get what you want? I mean, men do hard things. So men are like, oh, I'll tr this warrior archetype. I'll trudge through a river. I'll climb mountains. I'll go days without eating. I'll do all this physical stuff to handle myself, but oh, emotionally, that's weak. Well, if it stops you from actually having meaning and legacy and purpose and value in the world, you still willing to just be rigid and not look at, learn some new tools? Because 
initially it seems like, oh, no go zone. But once you learn there's a set of tools, it's like, oh, I got a hammer and I just hammer everything. Well, you take a hammer to a screw. How's that work out for you? You know, you need, sometimes you need a screwdriver and, and it's just another set of tools. So, so grief work is really a set of tools, but you got to be present to know when you need the tools. So think of the nervous system gets you present to notice, oh, I'm react. Um, there's an emotional reaction that's happening. I can see some trauma signs, either myself or somebody else that were dysregulated. So when you're able to apply nervous system tools, you get into the front of brain, which is compassion, empathy, rational thinking. When I'm here, what it does is it gets you present to go, what's going on with me? And when you start to get clear what's going on with you, there's tools that you can learn to do to what we talked about earlier, earlier, start to get into practices to move this diaphragm or move this center column. And the practices are all really simple. They're really, really simple practices. They're just uncomfortable because you're going to feel like if you get emotional and you're not used to having it, or there's anger and you got to get it out. Some guys have a resistance to feeling anger because they've shut that down. Some guys have a resistance to feeling some sadness or some emotion and they've shut that down. Some guys are just numb because they've shut it all down. You're going to have to reawaken those parts of you that just feels uncomfortable at first, but you do hard shit. So you're used to being uncomfortable. This is just another tool set where you have to learn to wake up more than just here. So you were, so you're actually breathing. You're actually, because a lot of people are just listening. They won't be able to see what you were can you, can you speak to that again? Yeah. So, so I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a somatic practice. This is one of the somatic practices I use to get into grief and it's a 10 minute practice. And in the practice, what you're doing is you're creating a safe, a safe space. Cause the way I look at it is, um, you need a safe place to grieve. I'm not an advocate of just grieving wherever you're at, all over the street, all over everybody, all over wherever you're at. Hey, there's something going on with me. How do I create a safe place? safe container to actually be in whatever's here, to be in this emotion. So first you're creating a safe place. Secondly, you're going in and you're doing a practice where um, you would be, let's say, moving the body. So if somebody's listening, I like grabbing a pillow. So if I'm grabbing a pillow and I'm rocking back and forth, because a lot of, again, a lot of our grief is even pre-verbal. A lot of the work that I've done, you may not even have memories of it, but it's stuck in the center column, which is that point before between your throat and let's say your belly button this is all the center column. And that center column is where all the grief stored, right? The deeper down is where the deeper trauma and grief is like part of the belly button. And so. Well, it, it's interesting because yeah, when, when you think about, you know, we've looked at where do you locate feelings? You know, when people are sad, we tend to feel it maybe in our throat or in the, in our, in the belly, like the deep, deep belly sadness. So yeah, we can really connect with that, that, that column in, uh, in the body being a place we store it. Yeah. And so all the practices around grief are accessing the center column and moving what's called your diaphragm. So if you just like somebody's listening, if you just, you know, got yourself like sitting up in a chair and then you collapse and you go back and forth, that's your center, that's your diaphragm moving, which is also what a lot of breath work and there's breath work you can do to actually move things through your body as well. So just kind of, it starts to connect the dots of like, oh, this is why I've heard breath work works or holotropic breathing or all these breath work. What are you doing? Center column movements. There are different ways to access the center column. Grief yoga, one of the guys I interviewed, he's got all these grief practices. What are you doing? Center column work. You're moving the diaphragm in the center column. So this is just another practice where you basically grab a pillow and then you start rocking back and forth. And then you just allow yourself to tune in. I like to put on some music, some drumming, some beating, and you basically allow yourself to just make some deep guttural. So you give a, a, a voice to it, um, deep guttural grieving type noises. So I might just sit there and go, oh, oh. And I'm just rocking back and forth, making that noise. I've done this in groups with a hundred men and had 90% of the, the room in grief in 10 minutes. So it works magically. I do some warm ups to get ready, but really what's going on is as you start to do that in some guys that have more numbness or more shutdown may take them more time. I've had people that take, it takes a little while to get into the grief. You may have to do the practice a number of times, but when you're going back and forth, the key is let your body do what it needs to do. So you may start to rock back and forth. You may move. I might, you might move to your left or right. You may make different sounds and different noises. You might find anger come up. And if it does, that's why the pillow's there to be like, oh, so I might be still going and go. And instead of the, ah, I might go, oh, and get into actual anger and actually feel the anger. Or I might feel deep sadness. And so I've had it where my body starts to kick and sh it moves into kicking and, and shaking, almost like I'm a little kid throwing a temper tantrum and that energy just moves to the body. I've had like deep sadness or coughing. So what you're doing is you're just, a, it's a very simple practice 
And when you allow yourself just to do the sound and movement of the practice, what it does is your body knows what to do. The body's brilliant and it starts to release whatever's on the top layer of grief that you're feeling at the moment. And then it runs its course. And when you're going through it, it's just like if you felt emotion before, you feel this emotional wave go through. And then when it does, it moves. And then you're back in your body again. And you're actually closer to your heart because you allowed the stuck energy of the metabolized grief that's been stuck to just move, get some movement, and you get more aliveness. So another way to look at it is that's costing you energy that's stuck in your body. And by continuing to hold it stuck, you're using the valuable resources of your body's energy to store that energy. So when you release it, you get more aliveness, you get more energy, you get more vitality back in your body. I, I love that you're really sharing a very simple practice, right? You're a Tony Robbins fan and he's got that, that uh, quote, which is complexity is the enemy of execution. Right. We can, we, if we have a practice that is too complicated, no, no man is going to do that. Is that a practice or is there another practice that you, given the fact that grief is a daily activity, is that the, the tool that you would recommend men to turn to on, on a daily basis? Is there another that you might offer? Yeah. So for, for me, the nervous system is first. Um, and so the nervous system, um, and I won't go too deep into it, but just the high level, cause that's a whole nother tangent, but the nervous system essentially is what moves you from a survival operating system, which was built to protect us and keep us alive. And you're moving into a, um, often a sympathetic state and, and the way to make it really simple. Imagine you're a vehicle and you're a Lamborghini and you're running, you're driving your vehicle on red line because of the stress in your life on a daily basis. So what happens is that stress when you red line, if you had a Lamborghini, could you just run the stress without continually filling up the gas? No. What happens if you run out of gas? You break down. So the first thing is you just need to be able to fill up your tank with gas. And the way that you fill up your tank is you have to regulate your nervous system. And that to me is a non-negotiable that's done daily. I do it two to three times a day, minimum twice a day. And every client that I coach, they're required to do it twice a day or we don't work together because when they do, they don't loop patterns. I, I, I have no zero tolerance for looping where you loop the same story over and over again. And it's like, you loop it because you're not doing the work. So if you are able to regulate your nervous system every day, you get you go from the back of your brain, which is survival based. That's the fight, flight, freeze, and appease reactions we do. It's the numbing behaviors. All that's back of the brain survival. And when you regulate, you come to the front of the brain, which is compassion, empathy, and the key point, rational thinking. So it means what else could this mean? And so when you're able to get there, you're able to look around and go, okay. I'm, re I'm reactive right now. What needs to happen with me? And you're able to go in. So just there's five quick ways to, to regulate the nervous system. Um, and then I'll give you a framework to use that anybody can use when they notice themselves offline to get back online. But the first one is breath. The one that I use and I teach it, I'll just start with one to make it really simple. So anybody listening doesn't get too complicated. But the key is longer exhales than inhales. So you can use a four, six breath which you're breathing in for a count of four and you're breathing out for a count of six. But the key of that is longer exhales. When you breathe out longer, what are you doing with the diaphragm? Keyword diaphragm. You're breathing out longer with the diaphragm. What it does is you have to do that for a minimum of six minutes for 36 of those breaths. So most people will do it for 30 seconds, think they're good, you're still dysregulated. So if you can have a practice in net time, so do it while you meditate, do it while you're driving to work. Do it while you're doing something else. Just build it in as a practice where you're breathing. What you'll notice about the five and a half to six minute mark, as you start doing this every day, there'll be a little downshift because you don't know when you're dysregulated. You actually don't know. So you'll be, notice a little shift. And what that shift does is it just gets you present. And then if you're present, you can now address what's going on with you emotionally. If you're not present, you can't address any of it. So that would be the fundamental tool if anybody's listening. If you just start doing this for 30 days straight, twice a day, once in the morning, and then once in the evening to come back to your family, it'll be a game changer. And you'll just start to show up differently and solve things very differently. So powerful. I love that. Simple and powerful 12 minutes a day to allow us to really be present for what's actually happening. Well, well, I'm, I'm thinking taste too, so many, so much of you, we, we often talk in our relationship work with guys, we talk about like transition time, 
you know, how to transition. A lot of men experience that and women too, as a, as a, as a, a conflict moment, a stress point where, okay, the day's work is done. And now I am entering the home or just walking through the, you know, the bedroom, the office bedroom door into the rest of the house where my relationship is waiting for me and conflict, right? And unable to really be present, switching modes. It's irritating. It's uncomfortable. And I think this is, you know, we're often suggesting take 30 minutes transition time. And what I hear and what you're sharing is, is, a, is another layer of that practice to also be mindful. We work with breath so much in our work too. You know, this nervous system, I, I'll, I'll, I've said this to couples over the years because this is something that I, I started to realize many years ago. I, I didn't discover this, but I, I, the teachers that I was studying, like Stan Tatkin, he's an amazing a psychotherapist who teaches nervous system regulation for couples. And one of the things I learned is that when, when you're doing relationship right, you're also managing your partner's nervous system, helping them be soothed in moments of stress so that you know, and if two people are, are paying attention to the nervous system stuff in the moment, man, relationship does legitimately get, dare I say, easier. Like it just does, you know, because you're not fighting about the same things that you would otherwise be fighting about. So, you know, Josh, you're, you're pointing at, uh, I love the simplicity of it. And, and to our listeners, like, do not underestimate how profound the impact that this can have. Yeah. And if I were to add one other piece, there's a methodology I created called CPR and it's just a really easy way to remember it. So the way I teach it is you do this twice a day, no matter what. And it's a requirement again, if I'm, if I'm when I'm coaching and if, and if, if they don't do it, shit shows up. So it's that easy. It's like, when you do it, you move quickly when you don't, all your stuff shows up. So the stuff showing up is you not wanting to do the work. So if you don't want to do the work, don't listen to this. If you actually want to do the work and start to resolve conflicts with whoever's in your life, then do this work. It'll get you present. Now, the second piece is when you notice yourself dysregulated and dysregulation could come from a fight, an argument, an addiction, addiction pattern, something where you, we talked about earlier, where you notice you're distracting, numbing, avoiding, or even just in a fight or a conflict. Um, the C is conscious awareness. So it's going to be CPR and you'd want to use CPR and I got it because I do a lot of work with first responders. They use CPR when somebody needs to be resuscitated, meaning they're offline. So I like looking at the nervous system. When we are in a dysregulated state, we are offline. We're in a survival reactionary state, any type of reactionary state. If we can become aware, conscious that we're in a reactionary state, like, oh, I just ordered a pizza and I said I wasn't going to eat pizza. Oh, I just got on spending. I'm buying a thing I don't need. Oh, um, I said I wouldn't yell at my kids. I just yell at my kids or my wife. Like, Okay, I just reacted emotionally. C, conscious awareness. P, pause. Literally, and you may have to build a pause in if you're in the middle with the conflict with the spouse and you just walk away, it's probably not going to work too well. So you have to, when you're regulated, build in a pause ahead of time. And some very active ones or couples will just say, hey, pause for 10 minutes. You both will get regulated and then we'll come back and finish the conversation. Or I had an entrepreneur on calls. He would pre-build a pause and say, hey, I got another call coming in. And that would give him a break to like take a pause, come back, and then actually be regulated when he handled. So C is conscious awareness, P is pause, and the R is regulation. Go take 10 minutes, get regulated. You can also splash cold water in your face. And there's a, if you just look up vagus nerve, there's a bunch of literature out there on what to do. But the fastest way is breathe. That's why I use it. And that's going to allow you to navigate a situation and actually resolve it or apologize or say you're sorry. Or there's a lot of other ways that you get resourceful when you start to tap into what you need. I, I love this. You're sharing that we we have a a, a different uh, tool, similar. Uh, but but one of the things that's coming up for me is this idea. A lot of what you're talking about, the foundation of relationship, the foundation of doing this is really doing it for ourselves, the intimacy with self. And for many of the men who we work with are, are in relationships where they're they they may even notice that they're regulated, but they're noticing that their partner isn't. What, what words of advice or thoughts or tools do you have for a man who is regulated, but noticing that his partner isn't obviously, uh, the worst thing that that guy could do is tell his partner to calm down. Cause that doesn't work. Uh, but, but what other things might you recommend for the guy who is able to regulate his emotions, but is with a partner that that isn't. Yeah. Great, great question. So if you see it, you got it. 
So the way our brains work is if somebody else is dysregulated, we're going to get dysregulated almost immediately. So if you see it, it means you have to do regulation to then co-regulate the space. And you can't do it if somebody's dysregulated and you haven't taken time to get regulated. So I'll give you a quick story to like show the example. Um, there is a, one of my clients, one of their core problems is he'd be out working, he'd come home and at certain times she'd be like obsessively cleaning the house or talking to her family. And he'd be like, what about me? Which is one of the common patterns I see. And he'd want to be like, and, and he had a fight or flight nervous system. She had a freeze and appease nervous system, which I also see link up quite a bit. So what do you think he would do? He would walk in directly up to her and sort of fight. This is one of the, and then she would freeze and just try to appease what he wants. And they'd be stuck in this conflict over and over again for years. What he started to do is know when he walked in the house, saw her cleaning and his narrative was like, she's not giving me attention. Where's she going? He would go, ah, conscious awareness, pause. Let me go outside. Let me walk the dog. Let me get into nature. Let me do my six to 10 minutes of breathing. Let me get more grounded. And when he would get regulated, he'd walk back in and he would go, oh, she's just regulated. Looks like she had a tough day. And he'd be able to walk up and say, hey, babe, do you need a hug? Do you need to talk about your day? So the point I'm making is when we're regulated, we're not reacting to their dysregulation. You're actually able to have, comp again, compassion, empathy, rational thinking. You have compassion for yourself. You have empathy for what they may be going through. And you're rationally going, oh, what else could this mean? That's not about me because I'm not dysregulated. When I'm dysregulated, it's all about me and whatever they're doing has to do with me, even if they're yelling at me. When we're regulated, you realize most of the time it has zero to do with you and you can lean in in a very loving, co-regulating way and lead the relationship or lead your partner into co-regulation. So if you find you're in conflict, you're dysregulated, a better way set. And if you're regulated, you don't get as offended by what they're doing. You just learn what can you do to get them regulated. Or on the one more flip side, if your partner's a fighter, you don't handle that. You handle a very different way. You have to learn to just say, hey, babe, take it down a notch. Hey, I need you to speak to me with respect. Take it down a notch. I'm not leaving, but just speak to me in, with respect and I'll handle this conversation. So you got to deal a little bit differently with different nervous systems, but I wanted to put that piece in there. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just worth pointing out, you know, as, even as I think about, you know, saying to my partner, calm down or, or the different techniques, the strategies that I use to get her to calm down. I'm only always in a place of anxiety myself. Like in that moment, I can feel, you just think, feel into it, you know? Yeah. Like I, I'm tight. I'm scared. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm frustrated. Like there's all kinds of things happening over here. The moment before I would be tempted to say, Hey, calm the fuck down. <laughs> right. So, you know, totally on point, Josh. Yeah. I, I'm curious, what advice would you give to men who are currently struggling with grief and feel stuck. Like a, a guy's listening. He's like, okay, I get it. You're right. Jesus, man, I'm sitting on a mountain of grief. I don't, I still don't know what to do with it. Okay. I do the breathing. But what if to a man who's still stuck, what would you, advice would you give him? First, put your, get yourself in a, in like a regimented schedule of movement. So get into some movement where you're exercising self-care. You're exercising daily, you're regulating. I would even recommend that you're doing cold immersion if you can do it. It's a very regulating practice. It's really hard to do. So even like a cold shower, but that cold shower is gonna, you need to shock the body more than the grief is overwhelming you. And what that cold will do is it'll shock you and wake you up for a moment. And if you do that, I have a, I have a client that does that. He's going through a divorce and he does it multiple times a day. And he said, it's the only thing that gives him relief for brief moments of time because the pain feels so real in those moments. And so one, get yourself a program first where you're moving daily, you're feeding yourself because often you don't want to eat or take care of yourself. So prioritize self-care with regulation, food, exercise, and sunlight and nature. I would say that's like foundation. And then two, the grief that you're feeling is your love. So, so grief is love. And so the grief that you're feeling is actually your love. And so if you can look at that as sacred, as hard as it is, that if you can learn to lean into that grief is sacred, it, it's, it's your heart. You fell deeply in love with the person, um, something in your life that you lost. And if you can learn to accept that the grief would ne may never go away, it's kind of counter advice that everybody else gives. Like, it'll get better. Only time will give this. To me, that's all bullshit. What actually helps somebody in deep grief is like, hey, this may never go away um, because a part of your heart is heartbroken. 
and you love that person or that experience or that dream deeply. So how do you learn to just accept this may be here for the rest of your life? And how do you learn to get really gentle, really loving with yourself? Um, I, uh, another, another piece of advice would be lower your, you're at very low capacity. So if your capacity is usually hundred percent, when you're going through deep grief, you're probably 20, 25%. So immediately adjust your lifestyle to, to build the time and space to be with that grief for a period of time, because you're not going to be on like you use you're on. You're going to be confused. You're going to forget things. And if you're used to running at a high level and now you're running really slow, now you're going to have shame and you're going to be beating yourself up. So instead adjust your calendar. So the next three months, six months, I'm going to run at lower capacity. How do I readjust my calendar that builds time and space in there for that? And that's going to relieve some of the self judgment or pressure you may put on yourself to just be in that grieving process. And then what happens is as you're allowing yourself to grieve, and there's a bunch of other practices from journaling to time in nature, to allowing yourself to just be with that, that spaciousness, that energy. One, one more quick, quick strategy, because it's coming through. One of my mentors, Ken Druck, did is he would walk up a mountain every day. And on the way up the mountain, he would give himself permission to yell and scream and say, fuck God, fuck God. like whatever was there, full expression on the way up. And then on the way down, he would go over what he was still grateful for, who's still in his life, what's still in his life. So add a practice like that to your life or daily, you're allowing yourself to feel and express however you could do it at home on a walk, but don't leave it inside of you. It keeps expressing it, getting it out. Um, and then what will happen over time is your heart grows. And this is how I experience it is. So the heart breaks there that may feel like it takes up your whole heart initially, but as you get used to loving on your heart, um, being there with your heart, going over what you're still grateful for over time, your heart grows around that. So the grief is still there, but there's a lot more love around that. And so over time, you'll, that'll start to shape and form you into the man that you're supposed to be. And that's what I find. I find grief sculpts our souls and crafts our characters into the men that we're supposed to be. That's beautiful. I've, I've also found nature, nature is such a, a, prof, a great witnesser and holder of grief. Like that hike, I've done similar practices. I've had groups of men doing anger yoga in the woods. Oh man, nature can take all we've got. Uh, and which should be done responsibly, of course, but I'm, I'm so present. Uh, I'm just so present to what, what a profound conversation and important conversation this is. And, and unfortunately how this probably just skims the surface because the richness and the necessity of it. And I, I love the, the, you know, the, the beautiful, uh, you know, image that you've created around the broken heart and the enlarged, large heart. I, I do have one final question that I just have to, you know, sort, which is where does forgiveness fit inside of this conversation? Forgiveness depends on if we're beating ourselves up or not. Oftentimes, not always. Um, oftentimes we can blame ourselves or get stuck in guilt. Guilt shows up quite a bit around grief. Um, and so when we're feeling guilty, like we should have said something different, we could have done something different. I had a lot of guilt for myself with my brother, the way the situation held. And forgiveness is one of the foundational tools that helps to break the shackles of self-imprisonment because oftentimes we're imprisoning ourselves. There's a a beautiful quote, I'm going to mess it up by Robert Frost that says, forgiveness is the rose or the scent of the rose after somebody steps on it, right? And it's this beautiful process of allowing yourself to give yourself grace. Um, and there's one, one thing that anybody can use. It's a process that came to me when I was doing some deep grieving um, of just saying these three phrases, I forgive myself, I forgive you, please forgive me. So it's a variation on like Honopono, but with Honopono, I find some people don't want to say all the words. And even with this, you may not be ready to say all the words if you're really angry with somebody. But there's two types. I'll just give a brief piece on forgiveness. There's two types of forgiveness. There's emotional forgiveness and decisional forgiveness. Emotional forgiveness is usually we're stuck ruminating our own negative thoughts where those ruminations actually metast metastasize and actually could turn into a lot of complications in the body, health problems, challenges, or just stuck in looping. Um, so what you're doing is you're forgiving yourself to transmute those heavy, dense, negative emotions to lighter emotions where you set yourself free. Decisional forgiveness is where you're trying to make amends with a specific person, like you're trying to be in relationship again. So I'm a fan of emotional forgiveness, which means you don't have to be in relationship with them. You don't have to be friends with them again. Like you don't have to engage with the person, 
you're purely doing forgiveness for you to say the words, for you to feel the words, for you to release it, but it doesn't require mending something with somebody, um, either your abuser, your violator, or the person that you don't want to connect with. So emotional forgiveness is a key component of forgiveness because some people have a really charged feeling towards a, a forgiveness and they're like, I'll never do this. But I will say this, just to preface it, and I honor everybody wherever they're on their journey, but a lot of times we have this anger and if we don't heal the anger, oftentimes we that anger gets passed down and it's the generational curse. And I've seen it happen in my retreats. I had a guy who was so angry at his dad for the way he treated his mom, not even him, that in his family unit, we pointed out, we're like, dude, you're doing the same thing to your child and your wife because you have so much anger towards your dad that you're literally repeating this pattern. And he's like, I don't care. I'm not willing to forgive him ever until he's dead. And I still won't forgive him. But he literally became the exact version of his father because that that anger that his dad carried, he carried, and he just became the thing that he hated. And so forgiveness releases that from us so that we don't have to carry that anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What a profound conversation. So Josh, uh, tell us just briefly as we wrap up about your movie, where can people learn more about what you're up to? Uh, yeah, man. Yeah. The film will be released December 6th through the 28th. I'm going to be having 22 days of grief conversations. And during it, people can join the grief conversations or actually also um, watch the premiere or watch the film. Um, and do you have a title for it yet? Yeah, it's called The Gift of Grief. So the film's called The, the Gift, Gift of, of Grief. grief. Um, the Only Way Out is Through. And um, right now it's currently available on a link on my website. So joshuawonder.com. But I'm building out a site now that'll be the Gift of Grief Film .com, um, or Gift of Grief Film .com. And and um, yeah, people want to get a hold of me now, they can get in touch at just joshuawinner.com or my social is joshuamichaelwinner.com. And I have nervous system work, all kinds of different things on there as well, relationship pieces. Amazing, man. Such an important conversation, Josh, and just honor your journey in it and through it. And uh, man, may you just such a servant to people. And, and, and I know this is a conversation we just want to be having more and more and more. So thank you for coming on, man. Thank you guys. So grateful, brother. Yeah, good to be with you, man. Love the conversation. Yeah, and love hanging out with you guys too. So super fun.